welcome to GWU. Um, and I mean that not only uh, figuratively, but uh, literally. Um, I'm speaking to you from my home. I'm actually one of the so-called last of the Mohicans, meaning that I'm one of the last faculty members that is still working on campus. And the reason is because I'm a faculty member, a faculty in residence, and so I live in a residential unit. And on a normal day, you might have heard a lot of noise in the background, and that's because I live in a faculty uh, in a residential hall where we have tons of students under normal times. So welcome to my home, um, and welcome to this session. Um, um, so first and foremost, um, I'd like to say uh, on behalf of my team, um, congratulations on being admitted. And I mean that not only on my side, but also on behalf of Dr. Paul Williams, who is the co-director of SBS, and also Jeannie Ann, who's on our chat room. And you might actually see some of her texts as well as she has joined our session. Um, so welcome again. Um, let me also say and publicly acknowledge and recognize your efforts. Um, we read your applications. We heard what you had to offer and we truly think that you would be a perfect fit for our program. I know that this has been some uncertain times and you probably have a lot of choices as well. And my message to you is that I hope that the Elite School and SPS will be a perfect fit for you. But do take a moment to acknowledge your success and recognize the hard work you've accomplished. You deserve it. So again, congratulations on being admitted. So let me talk a little bit about some of our, our highlight some of our assets, so to speak, what makes us unique. Um, and so these are some of the things that I think, from my own personal view, make SPS a unique place to study security studies. Of course, one of them is the fact that we are based in DC, um, where, of course, this is the place where policymaking is done. Uh, and so if you, you're interested in pursuing a career in a governmental agency, or in policy making, or with an international organization, uh, you're in the right place. Um, the other thing that really, you know, is a distinct feature of our program is that we we are vested in generating knowledge, but knowledge that can be applicable to the policy realm. Um, another asset of our program is the diverse background of our students and faculty. We have about one third of our students come from the services. One third of our students come directly from college, and another third um, comes from, you know, professional, having gained professional experience and then returning to school to kind of refine their professional skills. And that really makes for a very rich international, uh, rich community. About 10% of our student body is made out from students overseas, and they also bring a very rich and diverse approach to, into our classrooms. Flexibility is another thing that we're very proud of. You can finish your program as a full-time or as a part-time student. We have flexible schedules that allow you to work during the day and come to class in the afternoons and evenings. We really take on an interdisciplinary approach to the study of security studies, so we're not just married to one theoretical approach. Uh, we see security studies from a political perspective, from a legal perspective, from a historical perspective. We really want you to understand the general broad breadth of, of issues and topics um, that relate to security studies. Um, we also offer a variety of courses, not just academic courses, but also professional skill courses, um, field courses um, that will enrich your education experience. And finally, I'm extremely proud because we're one of the oldest programs. We've been here for more than 11 years, and we have a very rich um, um, network of alumni that are very well connected and have helped to enrich our networks um, with uh, the overall uh, policy community. Um, so the way we structured our program is in a way that we want to emphasize, emphasize two things, breadth and scope. We want you to expose, we want to expose all our students to general knowledge of security studies, but we also want you to gain some specialized knowledge about our fields of study. Um, so that's why we've organized our, our program into four main concentrations. So if you're interested in matters related to defense, intelligence, and foreign policy making, U.S. national security might be your concentration. If, on the other hand, you're interested in exploring 
the role of non-state actors, and that may include insurgents, terrorists, organized crime, and other illicit non-state actors, and perhaps national security might be a good concentration to focus on. If, on the other hand, you're interested in exploring the underlying conditions that allow wars to end, especially civil and ethnic wars, and what are the best conditions to implement a peace building, a humanitarian or peacekeeping operation, then conflict resolution is uh, uh, the right concentration. And we're also interested in exploring how nuclear, cyber, and other new technologies affect war, peace, and stability. So again, breadth and scope. Uh, uh, so you have a combination of general security studies courses, but then you also get to specialize. Um, so breadth and scope. And we're organized as a 40 credit hour program. And again, you can finish this as, as a two-year program if you're a full-time student or as a part-time student. Uh, we allow you to actually take courses during a five-year period if you're a part-time student. And so this is how our curriculum looks like. Um, all students have to take two core classes, international security and security policy analysis preferably during their first year. This is where we give you this general knowledge. Students have to choose out of four concentrations, U.S. national security, transnational security, conflict resolution, science and technology. And so they choose a concentration and a required class, and they take three additional courses within their concentration. Students can take up to 12 courses, on 12 credit courses uh, uh, of elective courses. They can be from within SDS, across our schools, at the Elliott School, even outside of GWU, thanks to the consortium that we have built with other 13 campuses around the DMV area. You can take up to three skill courses. That includes courses on negotiation skills, on writing, on oral presentations. We have a variety of skill courses. Students also have to meet one tool course, three credits, either in language or statistics. And finally, all of this you know, it's, it's all of these knowledge is it's wrapped up in our capstone experience, which is our signature course, a one year capstone experience where you implement a policy project. Um, we are also the program that offers the most courses, graduate courses at the Elliott School. We offer almost 70 courses on a yearly basis, about 30 courses in the fall, 30 courses in the spring and 12 courses during the summertime. Um, the list that you see here on the screen is actually the list of courses that we'll be offering this fall. And as you can see, it combines both breadth and scope um, in all four concentrations. And every time we also try to bring in new courses because we like to stay fresh, updated, and analyzing current topics. You know, recently one of our uh, colleagues asked me if we had any courses uh, that dealt with the global pandemic. And the truth of the matter is that we do. And we have a class called Emerging Threats, where we analyze some of these um, issues. But we're also interested on science and technology and national threats and the conventional security topics. So breadth and scope again. I'm also extremely proud of our very diverse um, faculty um, that it combines full-time faculty. These are faculty who have an appointment uh, as full-time professors dedicated to our program, as well as professors in practice, policymakers, visiting speakers, and whatnot. Um, and it's a, a very large team of professors. And I just want to highlight some of our um, most distinguished professors. That includes um, full-time professors who have conducted and are conducting top-notch research and security studies. It includes Michael Brown, who you see on his orange tie. He's actually the former dean of the Elliott School and the former editor of International Security, the leading journal in security studies. Um, to his right is Alex Downs, an expert on military effectiveness and the director of the Institute of Security and Conflict here at JWU. Um, he's also a leading expert on military issues. And some of the rising stars in security studies, like Fiona Cunningham, who completed her PhD at MIT and did a postdoc at Stanford, and is really uh, someone who's doing innovative research on science, cyber, nuclear issues, and US-China relations, as well as Roly Lal, uh, uh, the author of four books on transnational security. And all of these individuals are conducting, again, very specialized research, but they're also conducting research that has policy applications. 
So they bring all this knowledge into the classroom. We also have a number of part-time faculty members with vast policy experience uh, that also enrich our classrooms. And these are just a few of the faculty members we have in our team. It includes Michael O'Hanlon from the Brookings Institute, uh, who will be teaching a summer course. Ambassador Bonnie Jenkins, who was an, an Obama administration appointee, who served as leading ambassador to nuclear negotiations. Um, to Jonathan Schroeder, who is a director uh, of research at the Center for Naval Analysis. And all of these individuals bring vast policy experience and knowledge into our classrooms. And again, we have over 70 courses. We also are able to offer a variety of teaching uh, formats and options for you, in-person courses, online courses, hybrid courses, field courses, especially during capstone, skill courses, and whatnot. And in fact, for those of you who may have maybe facing restrictions for traveling, especially in the fall, we actually have all of our required classes are being offered online now. And of course, we offer all a vast number of courses, uh, not only required and core classes online, but other courses that may allow you to actually take classes online for your first and second semester. So again, this also brings flexibility into our curriculum. Um, another asset is, of course, because we are based in DC, there are lots of internship opportunities that um, you can benefit from. Um, and now actually we're also exploring remote intern internship opportunities, working very closely with career services here at the Elliott School. And for us, um, it's really important that our students get this practical experience because usually this is a pathway to getting a full-time job. And of course, when you're in DC, there are lots of these opportunities uh, where you can begin and explore uh, careers in the security sector. Under normal conditions, I would also set some things about our study abroad program, which we offer courses during the winter time, during the winter break, which is actually completed one in January in Egypt. Um, but for the time being, and given the current circumstances, this program has been suspended for the time being. I was actually working on a summer study abroad program in 2021 to go to Mexico to analyze border security. And so we hope that once um, things resume to a new normal, that we'll be able to reestablish our study abroad program because this is a fantastic experience um, to expose our students to language, travel, and cultural immersion. I'm sure that one of the questions that you um, want to ask is, where are our students uh, being employed and by whom? Um, so on the one hand, uh, I'll tell you that about 49% of our alumni are being employed in the public sector, and that is mostly the intelligence community and defense sector. But I have to say that a, non a rather non-insignificant portion of our students are also now working in the private sector. And that includes aerospace, technology, and telecommunications, as well as the nonprofit sector. In terms of salaries, about 90, well, first, I forgot to mention that about 90% of our students who graduate from SDS are able to find a full-time employment after graduation. And the salary range on their offer varies from anything between $40,000 and $89,000. So the success of our program stems also from the fact that our students are very successful in the uh, labor market. And, and these are some of the places where our students are currently employed. Um, and these, especially our alumni, uh, are great facilitators in helping other students find job opportunities. And we host a number of events with career services to help you in that endeavor. Um, so I want to keep it short because I know you all have questions, and I'll be more than happy to answer your questions and address your inquiries. I just like you to know that this is our contact information, and if you need any further information, you can, of course, contact us directly. Jeannie Ann is also available, our program assistant, to help you in your decision. And now I look forward to your questions, to answering your questions. Don't be shy. I'm sure you have questions, so. OK, 
Sure. Uh, so one question is, can I speak something to the fact about internships? So I would say that about 85% of our students are able to conduct some sort of internship opportunity here in Washington, D.C. Um, and that's just because there's so many internship opportunities here available. Um, and so it's a great opportunity, as I mentioned to you, to find a permanent job or to network. Um, uh, and again, as I said, because our courses are structured in the evening uh, and afternoons, uh, it's perfectly doable to engage in an internship opportunity. I know that many students would like to know, well, how many paid internships opportunities are there available? And the truth of the matter, there are a few of them, a handful of them, but luckily we do have a career services um, office that facilitates the search for these internship opportunities. I would say that my most successful students are those that probably started with perhaps an unpaid internship during the first semester, and then slowly were able to find something um, um, that was paid. Um, uh, um, but more importantly, it was a, 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 a pathway to finding something, a permanent job, so to speak. Um, is it possible to have two concentrations? Uh, no, so it's, it's not possible because, let me just go back to the, and show you the chart. I mean, you would if you're willing to take on more classes and pay more credits. Uh, but because our program is structured as a 40 credit um, course, um, and because you have to take core concentration electives and capstones, um, you can only complete one concentration at a time. Having said that, you can actually take classes uh, from other concentrations, right? Because um, um, we do have cross-listed courses. So I invite you to take a look at our SPS website. What are the advantages? All right, going too fast. What are the advantages of doing the security policy so program? This is the International Affairs Program. Um, that is actually a very good question. Um, so I would say that if you, if you already know that you want to work in a security sector related uh, uh, um, sec in, the, in, in the security sector, then SPS is probably the best program for you because it will give you breadth and scope, as I mentioned to you because you will have the network, um, that because you'll be working and analyzing uh, uh, security themes in a much more specialized way than you might do it in the MAIA program. Um, the MAIA program program is really a very general program that will expose you to all fields, not just security. So again, if you are interested in developing a career very specific in the, in the security sector, then SPS might be a better fit for you. All right. So let me go back and keep reading. Can you elaborate on any research opportunities that may be available to SPS students through the GW? So um, there is, there are actually, the Elliott School has a number of research institutes, and that includes the Institute on Security and Conflict, directed by Alex Downs, uh, and Institute of Africa Studies. Almost all regional programs have their own institute, and those are places where research is generated. What do I mean by research is generated? These are institutes that probably have some funding, um, uh, a grant, and a research grant to conduct research. In some cases, those programs will hire research assistants. And the way it works is that their positions are usually advertised through jobs, GW's Job Central, where you apply for those positions. We have noticed that, in fact, our own students um, are able to identify those research opportunities, especially during the first year once they come to us. And so we have a large team of RAs, uh, research assistants, uh, placed in some of these institutes. So let me put that. Can I please speak more about the Capstone Project and what that looks like? Yes. So the Capstone Project is really our signature course is the way in which we wrap up all the knowledge that you've acquired in um, a two-year program. Uh, the capstone is organized as a one-year program. Um, if you're a full-time student, you will usually start your capstone project during the second year. And there are three characteristics of our capstone project. One is a team effort, and it's a collective endeavor. Um, the second thing is it's policy-oriented. So what we want you to do in the capstone project is identify a policy problem that requires a concrete and practical solution. 
And then the third element is that it has to be conducted through some form of field research or research informed. Um, and I was at a, a fourth characteristic is that you have to identify a firm willing to take on your ideas and willing to at least guide you through the research phase. It's a one year uh, uh, course. It starts again in the fall and ends in the spring. We actually have funding, um, very generous funding for students who are interested in conducting field research overseas. For now, this has been suspended, obviously, given the, the current crisis. But um, that is really one of the most enriching experiences when students can go during the spring break to conduct field research for the capstone project. And when they come back towards graduation in early May or late April, the students will make a presentation, a presentation in front of a client. And it's very interesting because one, some students actually have been hired by the clients after conducting the research project, or they can find references um, uh, using their policy project from, that is derived from the capstone. All right, this is going to pass, so I'm just going to scroll up and see the questions. Uh, wait a second. Capstone, are there research opportunities with a faculty? Um, so there, there are, uh, not within SPS, however. Um, um, because SPS is not a research program, SPS is an MA program. Uh, and so we don't have a research project and we don't have a research grant, but there are research opportunities within the institutes. Uh, and there are also research opportunities in the school and in GW. So I can tell you, for instance, there's a program in Homeland Security, which is in a different school. And there's a program in cybersecurity in the School of Engineering and Business. And there might be some research opportunities there. If you're interested in research opportunities, what I would encourage you to do is go to GW Jobs, and then you'll see a link where it says Job Opportunities, and you can see all the job opportunities listed there. So what is the average cohort size and class size? Yes. So um, uh, on last year, we had an incoming class of about 89 students. Um, now, um, our average class size is 20, uh, meaning that our, most of our seminars, uh, you will not have more than 20 students in your seminars. The only exceptions are core classes and capstones. Core and capstone is where the entire cohort meets, and there's a, there's a reason for that. We want students first and foremost to get to know each other. It's a good socializing experience, but also because core and capstone involve collective um, and team efforts. We want all people to be concentrated in one class. So your core class probably will meet on Mondays from five to seven and is the entire cohort, about 100 students. And then the second part of the class, classes are usually split up in discussion sections. But those are the only classes where the entire cohort meets. And then the rest of your classes um, are, are kept at 20. So I'm, do I believe, hold on, do I believe it's feasible? To, ah, it's going really fast. I'm, I apologize, guys. Do we need to register for classes before August 28 orientation? And can you speak on the orientation? Um, yes. Yeah, so, you know, if once you've made your deposit and you have accepted our offer, you will receive instructions from the admissions office. And then registration usually begins during, early during the summer. Um, so I usually encourage students to register for their preferred classes early on, um, and because again, some of our classes are capped. And so, um, so if you have made up your mind um, uh, about our program, then by all means, I encourage you to deposit, to uh, respond to us, and then by June, you will receive instructions for registration and enrollment. And we're also here to facilitate that process. We can always advise you and recommend your courses um, uh, for the fall. So let me again go back to some of the questions that I hear here. Um, are students required to take capstone? Yes, it's a requirement for graduation. All our students have to take capstone course at the end um, uh, of their second year. Um, and of course, when you take capstone, varies if you're just a part-time student. But we can talk about that 
uh, um, uh, and let you know how it might work. Is there any way we can meet or communicate with fellow SPF before orientation? And also wondering either a way how to possibly find roommates in similar programs. So yes, we can always put you in touch with SPF students. Um, so if you can contact me or contact Jeannie Ann, um, we can also put you in touch with the students. We're also, we also have an SPS student board, um, um, and this is a volunteer-based organization that helps us organize events, conferences, speaker series, and there are about 18 members in our student board, um, and uh, those students are also eager to help and help you. And so if you would like to um, uh, connect with some of our members, uh, our student board members, just let us know and we'll put you in touch with them. SPS and uh, the MAIA program, do they have different requirements? Yes, they do. Um, um, I don't know about the requirements for the MAIA program, um, but um, they have different concentrations. So yes, um, they would have different requirements. So just to give you an example of different requirements, um, SPS has two core requirements, international security and security policies, policy analysis. Um, these are not required um, uh, from the MAIA. Um, Jeannie actually can answer to that question because she's an alumni uh, of the MAIA program. Um, so you can also touch base with her and ask her what are the differences in terms of requirements given her experience in the MAIA program. How does experience of part-time students differ from students who attend classes full-time and there is a notable difference? Well, so it's always a personal decision. I, I have a variety of students doing uh, part-time studies at SPS. Um, some of them um, have full-time employment and um, with benefits. And of course, for them, it might be a little diff difficult to commit to full-time studies, um, uh, especially when they have to pay rent or whatnot. So it's a personal decision for them to go on part-time. Um, these are also obviously very highly dedicated students. So they want to take the full benefit of you know, having employment and taking the courses and dedicating time to their studies. For other students, um, it, it really depends. I have students who are being sponsored by their employers, um, and, and, and you know that calls public and private sectors. And so their employers may ask them to just register as part-time students. Um, so the experience is overall the same, but obviously that's why we have conversations. Uh, at the beginning of each semester, we meet with every student on one-on-one -on -one meetings to take a look at their study plan and assess their career and their study plans to make sure that everything is well timed and that the student has a good plan for taking the courses. For these students, obviously, what our recommendation is start with some of the core classes. Maybe just take the you know one core and one required, and then you, you can take another class in the spring. Some of the students who are part-time students actually take summer classes, and that's why we have almost 12 different courses uh, offered during the summer, because they can catch up during the summertime, and our summertime is split into two sessions, session one and session two. So technically, you could take up to two, sometimes even three courses, depending on the schedule, during the summertime and catch up um, with the rest of your colleagues. All right, let me skip. Um, So Allison wants to know if can you, can you begin signing up for classes on April 16 if you would like to contact your account. So um, registration for the fall, we, right now we only open registration for the summer. Um, and so if you were to make your deposit and make your decision now, technically you could actually start taking classes during the summer. Registration for the fall will begin later, um, around um, late May, I believe late, late April and early May. We already have um, our fall schedule, uh, but registration begins um, later um, after the April 16 deadline. Uh, I have a very good question here about theses. Um, so theses is optional, um, and um, we want to be very clear about this. So who is an ideal candidate for a thesis option? We have a number of students who are thinking about maybe doing a PhD. 
um, um, or who are thinking about employment in a research-oriented organization, uh, like a think tank. Uh, Brookings would be a good idea, a good, a good case in point. And for these students, um, they, they want to show their research skills and their individual research skills. So for these students, we do have a thesis option. Uh, we, we like to encourage them to start talking to us about uh, thesis option early on, preferably during the first year, because the thesis option involves a thesis committee, so we have to identify a thesis advisor, main advisor, and two thesis re readers. We also have to make changes and implement changes into their study plan because these students have to take additional courses, especially research methods. Um, so again, if, if you think that a PhD program is something you have in mind for the future, this is a good opportunity to explore that area. But of course, we, we, we like to hear from them, from, from our students first before making that decision. Okay. Thank you, Joshua, for answering questions about registration. Uh, are the program social hours networking? Yes, we do have a number of, of events and network events. Um, SPS ha organizes a speaker series. Um, so we have a, a, an endowment of very generous alumni um, uh, donated uh, uh, an endowment to organize a speaker series that is run by the student board. And so we bring uh, uh, policymakers, researchers to come and talk to our students. And usually those events um, are organized along with a reception that takes place immediately after the speaker series. On top of that, uh, Career Services also organizes events with alumni, including dinners and receptions, uh, where we want our students to network and connect. And the Elliott School organizes a myriad of events. I think last year we had over 365 events. That was more, you know, more than one event per day. So there are tons of opportunities to network and connect with other um, members of our SPS community. So um, um, our students, uh, the question is, how are academic advisors assigned or selected? Um, so when you're admitted into our program and you accept our offer, you will be assigned to an academic advisor. In this case, her name is Elizabeth Lost. And she works only, mostly, with SPS students. So um, she would be your assigned or designated academic advisor whom you would work on issues involving academic, credits, graduation, requirements. Uh, and she's another asset that is available to our students uh, on top of the program directors and the SPS um, um, program coordinator. So let me. Do you know when financial aid packages will be released? That is a quick question that Joshua can perhaps answer. And I don't know, Joshua, would you like to answer that question about financial aid? Um, with any questions on financial aid or fellowships or anything concerning funding, um, students can email esiagrad uh, at gwu.edu, and we can help direct you to the appropriate resource um, if we're not able to answer that question. So um, feel free to email us with any questions that are not pertaining to the SPS program. Mm -hmm. I see a question here is, uh, regarding internships and full-time jobs for international students. Uh, and so this is something that, has, has, that I, at a personal level, have also been heavily vested in. Uh, as you can notice from my foreign accent, I, I was actually born and raised overseas when I came to the United States. Um, as a graduate student almost 20 years ago. Um, so we, we understand that sometimes finding full-time jobs as a foreign national, especially jobs that require security clearances, can be a challenge. However, one of the things that I've noticed is that the jobs available are not just limited to jobs that require security clearance. One of the advantages of being in a city like Washington, D.C., is that we have a whole variety of international organizations that are willing to recruit international students. The International Monetary Fund, the World, the, uh, um, World Bank, um, and a whole bunch of regional organizations, including the Organization of American States, 
PAHO, the Pan American Health Organization, as well as embassies. So one of the things that I've noticed is that some of our students, especially students from overseas, are often able to find either an internship or a part-time job opportunities in other embassies or international organizations. Um, it does require some networking and, 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 and meeting and making yourself available um, and connecting with people who obviously have connections in these organizations. Um, um, so let me keep scrolling the questions here. Can you explain the amount of focus SPS puts on policy versus strategy, operations, and history? All right, so that, that question depends on your concentration. So if you were, so the question is, can you explain the amount of focus SPS puts on policy versus strategy, operations, and military strategy? So if you're a student in US national security, that's one of our main concentrations. Um, then um, you are actually required to take U.S. national security um, as a required class. And then there are other classes available to you, including U.S. grand strategy, uh, uh, U.S. special operations, um, and then other related courses. So for, for students who are in the concentration in U.S. national security, the question is really, you know, do you offer those courses, is really kind of narrowing what courses you want to take. Uh, but overall, especially if you're in U.S. national security, we cover those three topics, policy, operations, and strategy. Um, and usually the course where all of these uh, subjects are summarized and briefed is the U.S. national security course. And then you have a whole bunch of other courses that you can choose from, again, almost 26 in U.S. national security. If you're actually interested in and in seeing how many courses we offer for each concentration, I highly encourage you to take a look at our SPS website and then look at all the individual courses that we offer for each concentration. All right, let me keep scrolling. Hey, Arturo. Uh, I think we have time for just one more question. Uh, so if you would like to uh, find the next question and then reiterate your contact information if students have additional questions after today. Sure, so let me just scroll down and put here the screen where we have our contact information. And then let me take on another question. What type of jobs um, can students um, uh, take in the private sector? So there are a variety of jobs. We've noticed that, for instance, Boeing and other companies, especially those who are interested in cybersecurity, have hired most of our students, especially in cyber and technology. But we also have noticed that students have been employed in humanitarian organizations, for instance, because they have a lot of expertise in that realm. Um, so we have science, technology, humanitarian organizations, and consulting firms as well that work for DOD. Can I take another question, Joshua, or have we run out of time? Um, so right now I'll need to begin preparation for our next session. So I urge anybody who has further questions for Dr. Sotomayor uh, or Ginny uh, to please utilize their uh, contact information on this slide. So if you do have any questions that either weren't answered today or uh, you have after today, please contact Dr. Sotomayor or uh, Ginny on his program assistant. Uh, but thank you so much, Dr. Sotomayor, for tuning in today um, and providing this information. This has been a great overview of the SPS program. Um, so thank you so much, and I hope you're staying healthy. Thank you again, and best wishes to all of you. Stay safe and healthy, and feel free to contact us. Congratulations again on being admitted to our program.